it, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here and speak to patients uh, largely from the St. Louis region. Um, I was just uh, sharing a story that uh, uh, I met Susan Norton a year ago, and uh, we uh, talked about holding an event just like this. So it's uh, a pleasure uh, to see it finally come to fruition. So as she said, I'm uh, going to be speaking about non-chemotherapy treatment of cutaneous lymphoma. I wanted to cover more than just the immune therapies. Um, so I'll start to dive in. And really what I'm going to try to cover uh, overall is the who, what, where, when, and how of systemic treatment excluding chemotherapy. Uh, because I think this starts to get uh, difficult for some patients to navigate. Um, but these treatments are delivered by a variety of providers. And sometimes the transition from one provider to another uh, is not always as smooth as it should be. And you really need to think about, uh, should you be pushing uh, from a patient's perspective to make that transition based on the condition of your uh, disease? Uh, I'm very fortunate that I work with Dr. Music and Dr. Huang, who will be speaking later, uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion. But most patients are seen in a uh, setting that is not multidisciplinary, where there isn't easy access and there isn't an easy transition from dermatology to medical oncology, for example. And then briefly, I'll talk about some possible future directions in systemic therapies, um, things that are available in trials only right now. And there are a litany of new trials that are on the horizon. I, I'm not going to go into detail in those because one, I don't know which ones will be available to us here in the St. Louis region, and two, who knows which of those are actually going to be a success or a failure. So when should systemic therapy be considered? And I, I start off with a physician's perspective, which is what I know best. Patients with multifocal disease, disease that is unresponsive to topical treatment, um, really, when we're talking about mycosis fungoides or CTCL, patients with stage 1B disease or higher, generally the 1A disease can be managed with a topically directed approach. When there's concern about a cosmetic outcome, for example, if uh, lesions are involving the face, that may sometimes uh, guide us to uh, use systemic therapy earlier. And then in patients who have severe symptoms, and I can think of anecdotes there of patients who, when we look at their skin, I wouldn't even know that they had mycosis fungoides. You biopsy it, you can see the mycosis fungoides there, but when somebody complains to me that their itching, their pruritus is so severe that they're uh, depressed and or considering suicide, I think that's a time for us to, get, uh, to use a systemic uh, treatment to try to get their symptoms under control. So from a patient perspective, when should you consider a systemic therapy? And really, uh, this goes back to something others have mentioned earlier. It's whenever we think the potential benefits of treatment will outweigh the potential risks. This is a long-term disease, as many of you know, that you will live with for the rest of your life, very likely. And so, we want to manage this over the long term. We want to get your symptoms under control, but we don't want the treatment to be worse than the disease. So is the symptomatic benefit better than the toxicity that you're experiencing, or we might expect, to, um, expect you to experience with different therapies? So how is uh, systemic therapy given? Of course, there are oral formulations, tablets or capsules. Uh, there are subcutaneous injections. Typically, this is uh, interferons, which I'll mention briefly later. There are intravenous medications. Those are often uh, given in an infusion center, typically known by an oncology uh, practice. And then, of course, there's apheresis. Uh, and that's where your blood is withdrawn uh, from one vein, circulated in a machine, it undergoes some processing, and then it's uh, put back in another vein. So where is the systemic therapy delivered? Some of this is intuitive. Uh, oral therapies are uh, 
from the comfort of your own home. The subcutaneous injections, again, from the comfort of your own home. Uh, I can say that some people don't like using needles. And even though I'm a physician, at one point I was asked to give myself injections and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I thought it was damaging myself. It was kind of a weird feeling. Uh, intravenous therapy, like I said, at a uh, infusion center. And then phoresis treatments are really limited to major referral medical centers. Typically academic centers. We're fortunate that we have two in this region. However, uh, we do see patients who come from a long distance away. And uh, I actually saw a patient on Thursday with a new diagnosis of sensory disease, and she came with a recommendation from another highly esteemed medical center, not in this uh, area, for uh, a phoresis, uh, photophoresis twice weekly for 26 weeks. She lives 100 miles from me. I did some quick math, that would be 10,000 miles of driving back and forth for that patient. Not very practical. So who prescribes these treatments? The oral and the subcutaneous treatments oftentimes are going to originate from a dermatologist. So if uh, you're seeing a dermatologist more or less exclusively, the oral treatments are available to the dermatologist. In some cases, the intravenous therapies are going to be available uh, in a dermatology office, but less frequently. And the reason for that is that they're just not set up to uh, give these uh, intravenous therapies, particularly as we start talking about the chemotherapies. Uh, and as I said, the apheresis is managed by medical oncology, dermatology, but typically at, uh, at a major referral center. So as we start talking about what are the uh, what are the systemic therapies that are non-chemotherapy, the first one I mentioned is for uh, anybody who has a cutaneous B cell lymphoma is rituximab. Rituximab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. CD20 is a cellu cellular marker, if you will, that's expressed on B cells, and so this antibody uses your immune system to target these cells as foreign and eliminate them from the body. It's a very well-tolerated intervention. Uh, we use it widely for treatment of other types of B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Medical oncologists are ex exceedingly familiar with this drug and the response rates are excellent. The difficulties with it, it, it is expensive. Um, the responses are not always durable, though certainly with the cutaneous B-cell lymphomas, I've had patients who have had uh, responses that have lasted several years to a course of rituximab. There are some side effects. Patients can develop infusion reactions, and there are rare but serious side effects that can even be fatal, but those are, again, really an exception, not the rule. So then, as we start talking about the more common uh, non-chemotherapy treatments for T-cell lymphoma, I actually broke these out from uh, some guidelines that are used to guide medical oncologists in their selection of treatments. And there are actually guidelines for the treatment of mycosis fungoides. Uh, this comes from the NCCN. Uh, that stands for National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network. Uh, there are about, that's about 40 academic centers uh, located throughout the country that are NCCM members. So these guidelines list retinoids, and the most common example of that is bexerotin, or targretin is the trade name for bexerotin. Interferons, um, the histone deacetylase inhibitors, I will mention two members of that class, and then extracorporeal uh, photophoresis. We typically just call it photophoresis. And then rituximab pedotin, which is sort of a hybrid. Um, it's what we call a drug immunoconjugate. So it is a antibody therapy to which a little grain of chemotherapy has been attached. Um, there's one other that's not listed in these guidelines that uh, we will use on occasion. It's an antibody therapy called alentuzumab or campanth. And I'll mention that uh, briefly later. But one point that I want to make clear, and I think I say it in the next slide, 
What the guidelines don't tell physicians is the optimal order in which these treatments should be given. This is a rare disease, and so there's really no good head-to-head -head clinical trial data. Furthermore, for any individual, I don't know, uh, at, at the start of therapy, I don't know whether treatment X or treatment Y is going to be the best for you, but we try to tailor that to your particular uh, clinical scenario. We try to tailor it to make it the best fit for, to help your quality of life and uh, provide the best chance of a response. The result of this uncertainty is that adequate responses are often seen after several ineffective treatments. And um, I, I can think of many patients who, for whom we will prescribe the therapy, and then we do have to say, hang in there, keep hanging in there. We don't want to give up on this one too quickly. But then ultimately, we do have to give up on the treatment because it's just not providing the degree of benefit that we need to see. Typically, we would say you need to try a therapy, particularly the non-chemotherapy treatments, for at least three months, and sometimes up to six months before we would uh, judge them to be a failure. And when you have severe symptoms, that can be a dreadful period of time, but uh, you do need to uh, hang in there, so to speak, so we can uh, truly be sure uh, if it's working. So to talk about bexeratine, uh, this is a retinoid, which is really a potent form, an engineered form of vitamin A. Um, it's a very effective drug uh, for many patients, and I think I have some efficacy data that I'll present uh, momentarily. We do have to monitor liver function, triglycerides, which is a component of a cholesterol panel, and then also thyroid hormone levels. Um, the bexerotene particularly uh, affects the triglycerides, which can, they can really drive them sky high, and that increases risk of other serious complications. Uh, the thyroid hormone, the bexerotene almost uniformly will drive down normal thyroid hormone levels, and unless we're supplementing the high thyroid hormone, patients will experience fatigue, excess uh, sleepiness, and other uh, side effects. Very typically, we will empirically, and that means without even looking at the levels, I will just start somebody on a cholesterol control, triglyceride control uh, medication regimen, and thyroid hormone supplementation. And very typically, it requires more than one medication in order to control the triglycerides, often up to four. So along with the targretin, which can be in some patients up to 10 capsules a day, and then we're talking about 10 or 20 other pills that go along with keeping the triglycerides under control. So it's not a small undertaking. However, given the responses that we can see, it is worth it for some patients, but not everybody. Uh, some patients will say that uh, taking all those pills makes them feel sick to their stomach, and I don't want somebody to feel sick to their stomach all the time. So if it really becomes a problem, we can switch gears and use a different medication. So the, the pros, we have very good response rates. Some are deep and long-lasting. They can last for years, generally not forever, but certainly we've had patients on uh, Bexerotene for a number of years with good responses. One of the cons is the high price. This is a tremendously expensive intervention. I have one patient where if she were paying the retail price, it would be over $800,000 a year for her medications. Uh, however, as uh, our excellent uh, nurse coordinator will get into later, uh, we do everything we can to make sure that there are minimal out-of-pocket costs for that so that it's manageable. I mentioned the multiple, multiple supporting medications. Some uh, patients will have headaches as well. So some of the pivotal trials looking at the responses to this medication. First, in patients with more advanced disease, the overall response rate was 45 to 55%, which for patients who have received a number of therapies before, this is quite good. And then for patients with earlier stage disease, the 
uh, responses were comparable. It is worth pointing out, I'm not a big laser pointer person, but uh, there is sort of this dose response. And this was a, a very low dose before we really knew uh, how to dose this medication. And there were still responses at the lower dose. As a result of this, uh, we will often start low because you can sometimes see responses at the lower doses. And then if somebody's not responding, we will go ahead and escalate the uh, dose. So the next group is uh, the interferons. It's an inflammatory cytokine that, for lack of a better term, stimulates the immune system. This is a subcutaneous injection. There is a long-acting form of interferon that we will use that uh, can be administered weekly. Uh, the more traditional short-acting form of this drug is given uh, three times weekly. Often it's given in a combination with phototherapy, such as the PUBA therapy mentioned earlier. And the response rates are reasonable, maybe not as good in our clinical practice as we're seeing in some of the earlier trials. Uh, but it can be well tolerated over the long term. It's generally not well tolerated in the short term. I don't know if anybody in this room has gotten interferon, but it's made it so it's not our, our first go-to many times, despite the response rates, uh, because of uh, how poorly it can be tolerated initially. It's expensive, and in the short term, patients experience flu-like symptoms, and imagine taking an interferon shot three times a week, and then three times a week the next day, you feel like you have the flu. You do that for a number of weeks, eh, the treatment can start to become worse than the disease. Other things that can happen is severe depression, uh, also thyroid abnormalities. So it's not a perfectly clean uh, medication, but the responses, and this was a study out of Northwestern University where I actually uh, did my oncology training and was part of their uh, multidisciplinary uh, cutaneous lymphoma clinic there. The response rate, a complete response rate of 62%, which is phenomenal, and an overall response rate of 90%. That does seem a little bit too good to be true, to be perfectly honest, but uh, there are good responses to these drugs, and for patients who can uh, tolerate them, it's a very good uh, treatment option. The next oral therapy, and again, these are, I'm trying to go through and order uh, treatments that, systemic treatments that will often be offered, maybe in the dermatology setting, um, also the on medical oncology setting, but things that are available to a, uh, more easily available to a dermatologist. Next is an oral histone deacetylase inhibitor um, known as varinostat. This is four uh, tablets that are taken daily. Patients can have low platelets, a type of uh, blood cell, if you will, uh, diarrhea, neuropathy, which is a numbness or tingling in the fingertips or toes, blood clots, nausea. We actually do see a fair amount of hair loss with this one. The advantage is it's administered orally, and patients can experience, even if the mycosis fungoides lesions are not regressing, can experience an improvement in the uh, itch, which, as I mentioned earlier, can be severe and probably some of you know about all too well. Uh, the downside is the expense and the side effects that I've mentioned before. And this uh, sort of plays to a point that Dr. Music made earlier, that uh, the response rates as we start talking about some of these agents, uh, they're not terrific. Uh, here, uh, with Varinostat in the pivotal trial, the response rate was about 30%. So that means a considerable majority of patients are not going to respond to this medication significantly. Um, However, I think the caveat here is that many of these patients were heavily pretreated. By definition, to be in these studies, you had to fail two prior systemic therapies. And the median number of therapies that the patients had failed was often more than that, uh, like three or four therapies. So these are patients who have had a number of therapies in the past. And so there's some thought of we're using it a little bit earlier in the uh, treatment mix 
that the uh, response rates may be better. So now I'll go through medications that I think, for the most part, require a dermatology to oncology transition. And that means they're administered uh, more often by a medical oncologist. And if you're not seeing a medical oncologist or you've never seen a medical oncologist, I mean, as I said, I, I work in a multidisciplinary setting where all the patients are going to see both a uh, medical oncologist, myself, and my dermatology colleague. But if you're seeing just a dermatologist and you feel like your symptoms are severe, you may need to help drive that and suggest to your dermatologist either a referral or generate your own referral to the medical oncologist. So the first drug I'll talk about here is Robidepsin. Rovidepsin is another uh, histone deacetylase inhibitor like Varinostat, but it's given intravenously. Usually we will start out giving it three weeks out of four. This is not a trivial undertaking. Side effects, fatigue, nausea, dysgeusia, which is, uh, even I have to look up some words like this sometimes. Dysgeusia means you're eating something and it tastes funny. And nothing seems to taste right. Almost everybody who gets this medication tells me that things don't taste right afterwards. It's sort of a strange side effect we can't really explain, but that's what happens. Low platelets can occur uh, with this medication, but we monitor that. It is very effective in some patients, and we've had some patients use this medication for years. Uh, and when, we're, when we achieve a good response with this, we may start off giving it every uh, three weeks out of four, we'll back off to every other week, every third week, and in some cases, once a month. And that's enough to control the, uh, the disease. The bad downside of this medication, it's expensive, and it does have a four hour infusion time. So that can eat into one's quality of life if every Friday or Monday or whatever day you pick, you're having to go get a four hour infusion. You spend half your day uh, in the hospital. In the pivotal trial, like other agents, the response rate was on order of 30%. But again, these are heavily pretreated uh, folks. Most of them uh, had advanced stage disease, 87% were stage 2B or higher. Uh, some were 1Bs, but most were more advanced stage. And like Varinostat, many of these patients uh, with stable disease, even if the disease didn't shrink, the obvious disease didn't shrink, there was an improvement in the pruritus. And for folks with very severe pruritus, that can make a huge difference in the quality of life. The DOR, which I'm sorry, I sometimes break into doctor lingo, that's duration of response. Median duration of response is 14 months. So that's just over a year. And here are, are some uh, responses that were actually quite good. Now understand this is in the pivotal trial, and they're going to pick some of the best responses to demonstrate in the uh, literature. But you can see uh, before and after photos, very good responses in these patients. Now I'll move over to extracorporeal photophoresis, or uh, photophoresis. This is a uh, treatment modality that I would say, I, I think my colleague and I are, are a little bit less inclined to use. I, I think other people have had good success with it. Our success has been a little bit more mixed. Uh, this involves often having a phoresis catheter placed and then having somebody come in for uh, several hours of uh, phoresis uh, hooked up to a machine doing that twice a month. Sometimes that will be escalated to uh, even four or even more times per month. Common toxicities uh, or fatigue. And then in relation to any sort of foreign body, uh, the catheter, people can get blood clots. Um, in some retrospective studies, uh, response rates were up to 71%. I would say and this is somewhat anecdotally, but uh, our experience has not been quite that good. Uh, oftentimes, this will promote more of a stable disease as opposed to an actual response in the disease. So 
One caveat with this is it's typically limited to patients with erythrodermic disease or a higher sensory cell volume, so the circulating cells in the bloodstream, which sort of makes sense as the machine is taking the blood out and processing it to try to uh, treat the sensory cells that are in the blood. If you don't have a lot of sensory cells in the blood, uh, it may be less effective. I know there are some people who still believe it's very effective in that setting. Again, our experience has been more mixed. Um, the problems with this therapy, you know, nothing comes with a free lunch or the uh, financial toxicity that is expensive. And then the uh, patient burden, I think, the travel and treatment time, which I mentioned earlier. So then there's the um, drug immunoconjugate, rituximab vidotin. This is a relatively new treatment option. It was FDA approved in 2011. And it works, uh, it's an anti-C30 antibody drug conjugate. MMAE is the shorthand for a type of chemotherapy called monomethyl orostatin E. I promise I won't quiz you on that later. <laughs> Toxicities with this drug, low blood counts, uh, peripheral neuropathy, and a, a rare condition called uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And as you might gather, that, that's pretty bad to have. I wrote a paper about it, and there was a patient with cutaneous lymphoma who uh, received rituximab not here at our institution, but elsewhere, who then developed this rare neurologic condition that uh, had a significant impact on life. Um, the efficacy is quite good. Uh, the duration of response is generally less good. The thing about this is we, we don't fully understand how to best measure this, but this is an antibody to a marker called CD30. And so the tumor cells ideally should express CD30 on their surface in order to see responses. Now there is some evidence that the more CD30 we see on the tumor cells, the better the responses are, but there are even some responses in patients who don't express CD30. Currently at Washington University, we have a trial open that incorporates this drug. However, in order to get into the trial, patients have to express CD30 on their tumor cells. Just who I am, so I'm run out of time. Alemtuzumab, uh, this is a older drug. It's actually been available. It was used to treat a B cell malignancy. Um, it's been available for some time. And we use this on occasion uh, because it can be very effective at pulling sensory cells out of the bloodstream. And this is an anti-C52 monoclonal antibody. Um, the dosing regimen is uh, a little bit more intense. It's three times a week. Um, sometimes we can give it subcutaneously, but we can't send you home with alentuzumab to use at home. Uh, and usually we do that three times a week for 12 weeks. Patients can have an infusion reaction. The big downside of this one is it can cause some severe immune suppression. And opportunistic infections uh, are a risk. I have jokingly called it HIV in a bottle um, because it so severely suppresses the immune system. And that's a way I can express that to folks uh, who I'm considering using it. This severely suppresses your immune system. So we need to support you with uh, infection uh, prevention medications, including an antifungal agent, an antibacterial agent, and an antiviral agent. And we have to monitor uh, this uh, antiviral agent here, valgancyclovir, uh, treats a, a type of infection called cytomegalovirus, which we monitor for very closely in patients who are receiving this drug. So because of the uh, immune suppression, we tend to put this later in our list of uh, things that we would choose to use. We don't want to subject people to multiple medications and the risk of uh, <coughs> infection. So some of the clinical data in patients with sensory disease, 
showed overall response rate of 55%. And the patients with sensory syndrome, so the high circulating numbers of tumor cells, 86% of those patients cleared the blood, which is spectacular. So quickly, I will go through some uh, possible future directions, things that have trials that are winding down, others that are winding up. And then I don't have enough time to go into a number of other options that may be on the horizon of new immune therapies uh, that have been developed and are in early phase trials. But quickly, I will talk about Mogamilizumab. This is a uh, study that we have uh, open at Washington University, but it is no longer enrolling patients. This was a randomized comparison between this new drug, mogamulizumab, versus varinostat. Mogamulizumab is a uh, humanized antibody to a marker called CCR4. Uh, common toxicities are infusion reaction and, and actually fairly commonly a treatment-related rash. So we get rid of one rash, but give, them, give you another rash. However, we can manage that with the uh, topical corticosteroids. Uh, the response rate in uh, sensory syndrome in some earlier trials was 47%, and then in standard mycosis fungoides, 29%. And I will say, uh, we do have some folks uh, who enrolled in this trial at Washington University for whom this drug has been life-changing. Truly poster children for what this drug can do gentlemen who have diffuse erythroderma, very severe, that has completely resolved. He drives three hours each way to get his infusion, but he says it's worth every minute on the road. Another area that we're exploring uh, right now, there is a trial of what's called a PD-1 inhibitor. So these are antibodies that block what's called the programmed cell death protein 1. Again, I won't uh, quiz you all on this later. But basically, uh, the tumor cells uh, become smart, and they express a protein that tells our immune system not to attack them. What this drug does is it covers up that protein, so then the immune system once again begins to recognize it as foreign. So it's using your own immune system to attack the uh, tumor cells. There's a preliminary report I saw presented at a meeting two months ago where the response rate was approximately 50%. Um, there are some rare side effects with these drugs, lung inflammation or autoimmune conditions, but generally these are very well tolerated. People don't have the same type of fatigue and other uh, side effects that they might have with chemotherapy, for example. Currently, we have this available for cutaneous lymphoma in a clinical trial. Uh, at Washington University, um, where we actually give brentuximab bedotin first, and then follow it with the PD-1. So, um, as I try to wind this down a few minutes late, there are many options available, but we don't always know which one's going to be right for a patient, and there are no good head-to-head -head trials of these drugs. As patients, I think you really may need to drive some of the referrals between dermatology and oncology, community to academic medical centers. And then another area that I think we do quite effectively is an academic treatment plan, but with local delivery. And what I mean by that is patients will see us at the university, but they live two or three hours away. And if we're using an FDA-approved medication, we will coordinate with an oncologist closer to home so that they're not driving to St. Louis every week. They can get uh, infusions closer to home. Uh, I think the treatment selection should be individualized, and really it needs to reflect numerous aspects of an individual situation, their location, um, other medical conditions, uh, that we call comorbidities, uh, the severity of the disease, and the severity of symptoms. With that, I'm going to be five minutes over. I guess I'll take some quick questions. Or we do have a couple online questions, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Um, somebody would like to know, how long does bexeratine take for a full response? And in general, if medications are well tolerated, how long is each treatment tried before moving on to the next treatment? 
So the Bexerotin response, uh, people can see early responses within a, a couple months, sometimes even uh, faster than that. But generally, I would say at least four months, if not six months before I, I would uh, judge how deep somebody's response can become. And then what was the second question, I'm sorry? And then how long is each treatment tried before moving on to the next course of treatment? So how long treatments are tried? For the non-chemotherapies, I want to give them several months before we would move on. Now, if somebody, frankly, uh, has progression where the disease is clearly getting worse despite the therapy, then we can stop. But in terms of seeing how deep a response will go or waiting for a response, a non-chemotherapy should take several months. We should give it several months. Chemotherapy is a little bit of a different uh, ball game, and uh, I think my colleagues in back is going to speak about that momentarily. That I would expect a bit of a quicker response, and uh, if somebody's not responding fairly quickly, we would move on. And when I say quickly, usually within one cycle or two cycles if somebody is uh, not demonstrating a response, so that would be a month or two. We do have a few more, but I want to give the room the question, questions first. Can you explain uh, when and why cancerous, cancerous cells stay in the skin versus circulating in the bloodstream? And when they do circulate, how likely are they to cause other cancers? So, you know, that's sort of a, a million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to get a million dollar prize anytime soon, so I may not be able to answer fully. But, uh, something about these tumor cells, and some folks, the uh, tumor cells home into the uh, dermis and epidermis very effectively, and other times it's less effective. And when it's very effective, then they tend to have cutaneous only disease, whereas if it's less effective, they may have the higher uh, circulating accessory counts, uh, more cells in the bloodstream. Um, in terms of the effects elsewhere, really it's it's unusual, despite the circulating tumor cells, they may be present in the bone marrow, but they generally don't cause other malignancies or other problems elsewhere. I mean, they are contributing to a risk of a, a, a secondary risk of other types of lymphoma, but that's more due to the, what we would call immune dysregulation, where there's something not right about the immune system that's allowing the T cell lymphoma to be there, that then is predisposing to other types of uh, malignancy. But those ce the cells being in the bloodstream itself is not necessarily predisposing. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but you said that they move towards the skin, so the actual abnormality doesn't necessarily start in the skin. Um, do the well, we don't know exactly where they start, like where the where the lymphoma starts. Is it starting in the bloodstream or is it starting in the uh, skin? It's just sometimes the malignant cells have a better uh, ability to uh, stay in the skin mm -hmm. versus uh, others. We have a question about romadepsin. If a patient responds quickly to the treatment and goes into remission quickly, does that in any way suggest that the person might have a more durable response? Is there a correlation between early response and durable response? So that's an excellent question. I don't know that that's ever been formally studied. What I can say is that somebody who's responding quickly to a medication is probably uh, something about their disease is telling us that they're going to be a good responder and indeed those folks may have a better uh, long-term response but i don't know that that's ever been studied properly we have one more online and then we can break uh, with alemtezumab if you use a low dose of 10 milligrams and do the treatment subcutaneously instead of intravenously does that substantially reduce the immunosuppressive effects. There is some evidence uh, from a study that was performed in Italy that the immune suppressive effects of alentuzumab are reduced uh, when we use the lower dose, the uh, 10 milligram dose. I don't think the delivery uh, mechanism, IV versus subcutaneous, uh, makes a huge difference there. 
Um, so there is some thought that it will reduce the immune suppression when we use the uh, lower doses. The concern that I would have as a medical oncologist is are we driving the disease down as deeply, in which case maybe the responses won't be as durable. So there's some give and take, some pro and con in that situation. You have a very knowledgeable patient population, <laughs> 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 Thank you all. <laughs>